Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. It's your girl Precious Malepo. And as you can see by the title in this video, I'm going to be discussing the engagement planning process. And for those of you who don't know, this is the first step in the audit process where the auditor firm or the auditors are basically evaluating whether they should accept a client or not. I feel like this section is a great opportunity to generate marks. Um, it was easy in undergrad, then you get to CTA and it just gets pretty damn complicated. Um, but not really, I feel like um, exam technique is everything when it comes to this um, topic and you can really maximize your marks. So if you're interested, uh, keep watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. So what exactly is engagement planning in the audit process? Like I mentioned, this is when the auditors are deciding whether to accept a client or not. Um, this can happen for new clients and it can also happen for reoccurring clients. Audit is an official inspection of an organization's accounts, typically by an independent body. So basically, as an auditor, you're looking through a company's accounts to make sure that their books, their financial statements are free from material misstatement. In the engagement planning process, you are deciding whether to accept a client, a new client, or you're deciding whether to continue with a client that you have already accepted in previous years. So in undergrad, when it came to this topic, it was very straightforward. It was basically cram the framework and then when you see this question in the exam, you just throw out that framework and then you include the client's name here and there, include the audit firm's name here and there, and then there was your application marks. Then you get to CTA and it's a bit more difficult. I personally found that just speaking on the framework wasn't enough to generate 50 marks. So there's a lot of a lot more tips and tricks I had to learn to topple my mark for that section over the 50%. So just to start off with, what exactly is the audit framework? So that is the audit framework in terms of engagement planning. That is the um, client investigation, second skills and competence of the audit, and then thirdly, the engagement letter. So to break that up, the client investigation is made up of independence, it's made up of integrity and it's made up of uh, communication with predecessor and auditor. Then the second step, skills and competence, is basically the skills and competence as well as the resources of the auditors. And then last, the engagement letter. Um, has an engagement letter been signed and can the client afford to pay the engagement fees? So let's just speak about those in a bit more detail. So with client investigation, with the independence, Basically, we want to determine whether we as auditors are independent to the client that we want to accept or independent to the client that we want to continue into another period doing an audit with. So why is independence important? Because as we spoke about in the definition, an official inspection of an organization's accounts, typically by an independent body, this is basically so that you can issue a qualification or an audit opinion that is free from bias, that's not pulled one side because of any benefits that you may be able to receive or some self-interest, it's a self-interest, mm. any self-interest that's that you may have. So basically the opinion that the auditors will give can be relied on because they're free from bias. When it comes to independence in a scenario, um, a trigger is usually something like some sort of relationship. So if you we're talking about ABC auditors and you see a relationship in the client's information, so this would be like the information while you're reading in the exam, and you see something about, oh, ABC auditors will be auditing um, CIPO's company. CIPO is the brother-in-law to the engagement partner. Your bowels should go off that there's an independence threat because they know each other, they're familiar with each other. 
which means that um, the engagement partner won't be able to perform the audit uh, being free from bias, being objective because he's doing it for his brother-in-law, right? So already that is um, a threat to independence and something that should be discussed, something, something that should be written out. So you actually write out that part in the scenario. That would be your application. So application is just, okay, we know you know the theory, but can you apply the theory to the scenario? So an example of this would be the engagement partner's brother-in-law is um, the owner of the company that ABC auditors are considering to audit. This is an independent threat or an independent threat exists um, and the ABC auditors aren't completely independent from this company, for example. That would be an example of your application. And then next on the client investigation is your integrity. So this is basically us looking at the client as a person. Are there any red flags about this person? Um, is there anything that like causes alarms to go off? This can be anything like uh, character flaws in the sense that, um, let's say the, the client mentioned, oh no, I don't pay taxes, taxes are for the dogs already now our client integrity um, is, at, is at an issue now we're questioning the client integrity of this client because paying taxes is required by law so if this client is openly saying I don't pay taxes, taxes is for the dogs, then we know that the integrity of this client isn't at its highest and do we want to associate ourselves, we as the auditors, do we want to associate ourselves with this client? Integrity is defined as the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. So when we look at integrity of a client, we look at is this client honest? So the fact that this client is saying, I don't pay taxes, taxes are for the dogs, shows that the client is not honest. They don't have a strong moral standing. Do we, as the auditors, want to associate ourselves with this client? Then lastly, um, communication with the predecessing auditors. We want to basically talk to the auditors and find out if there's any reason that we shouldn't accept this client as our client on which to perform the audit for. We're looking at skills and competence. This is basically now us looking at ourselves as auditors. Do we have the necessary skills and competence to perform this audit? So when it comes to the step, there's a lot of things you look at. You look at experience of your staff, you look at the size of the audit firm compared to the size of the company that you want to take on as a client. You also look at technology. If let's say this client is very um, savvy, let's say for example it's an IT company, that would mean that our IT knowledge needs to be up to date. This is us as the auditors, our IT knowledge needs to be up to par because if it isn't then we won't be able to perform a quality audit. If it isn't up to par, are we able to find IT um, experts that would help us in this audit? Um, yeah, so size, the staff, experience of the staff. Also, if you look at their software and how they perform their audit, let's say, for example, our client or the pers our prospective client um, has their systems and accounts and transactions online. As is the auditors, do we have software that would allow us to audit that uh, 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 their transactions and accounts online as well? Do we have software that is compatible with their transactions and their systems that they use for their ordinary business that would fall under skills and competence? Then lastly, we look at engagement. So basically accepting the engagement, engagement letter, so at this point, we look at did they sign the engagement? We also look at the ability to pay the engagement fee. Very important because remember the engagement fee really determines, um, not determines, I don't want to say determines, but um, it's important to know that the client can afford to pay this engagement fee because 
if they can't afford to pay this engagement fee, this may result in constraints. For example, if I want to do a stock count in Cape Town at a branch for ABC for this client, right? So if I want to do a stock count at a branch for this client, but there's some sort of financial strain, and I'm like, okay, no, we're not going to do the stock count in Cape Town at the made warehouse anymore because they cannot afford. Already that is affecting our quality of our audit, which um, it shouldn't be. So when you discuss your audit fee, they should accept it, they should sign it before the audit even begins. That's important. Also, they should have a vacancy, so a vacancy should exist. Is, are, is this company's previous auditors still in the picture? If they are still in the picture, then a vacancy doesn't exist. What is a vacancy? A position to fill as an auditor doesn't exist. If they don't have auditors anymore, then the vacancy exists. So that's basically the framework when it comes to answering engagement and planning. So like I mentioned in undergrad, I felt like just mentioning the framework was enough. Come to CTA level, I really felt like it wasn't enough. So I had to go further to generate marks to pass the engagement and planning question. So where exactly I went to was speaking on the risks. So from the scenario, I would try to identify risks. Usually engagement and planning questions are set out as what are some of the things that ABC auditors should have considered or should consider when accepting their new client. Um, then this is a perfect, after obviously speaking about your framework, a perfect opportunity to now go speak on your risks. So for example, if they operate in a heavy legal regulation environment where they'll have a lot of compliance requirements, that's a risk as I to us as auditors that we need to consider because that would mean that we, there's a lot of regulations that we need to check and if they so aren't complying with something and we don't pick it up it's a risk on us it's a risk on our reputation as auditors so that is a risk that needs to be considered before we accept um, a client as uh, our our audit client something else that we can look at is a uh, fraud if there's like suspicions of fraud we can raise that as a risk for example if there's one manager that runs everything like let's say for example um, during our uh, understanding the entity process we find that no there's this guy Sipo he's the CEO CFO he's also the driver he's the worker already we want and it's a huge company we want to consider whether we are going to accept that client because there's a huge risk of fraud due to a lack of segregation of duties. That is something that we can raise in engagement and planning um, because it could affect us auditors, it could affect our opinion, it could affect our reputation as well and something we need to consider. And then also lastly we should consider going concern if there's non-payments, if there's um, a lot of debtors that haven't been paid and there's just financial constraints and cash shortfalls uh, shortages sorry um, then we need to consider is this company a going concern if they're not do are we sure we want to accept them as a client because just think of all that work that needs to be done if they're not a going concern okay the non-compliance companies act just going concern is a huge thing and it affects everything and it's just a lot of work and remember a lot of work means a lot of risk for the auditors because there's a risk that they might miss something, they might make a mistake. Um, also, it's a risk that they may not, the client may not be able to pay their audit fee, which is a problem as well. So yeah, that's the second thing I would speak on is the risks. So I really like this step in answering pre-engagement because it allows me to consider the scenario because a lot of the times when we're working off a framework we kind of box ourselves into the framework so even though we might be reading through the scenario and see relevant principles and points that could help uh, back up our answer we kind of skip it because this is not part of the framework and uh, okay the road has potholes for example the road has potholes 
uh, then we skip it. Oh, okay, no, but it doesn't fit into investigate the client, it doesn't fit into skills and competence, it doesn't fit into <clears throat> signing the engagement letter. But it could fit into the risk part. So risk really opens up your eyes to the other parts in the scenario where you can bag some marks. And then lastly, what I look at is the CPC, which is the Code of Professional Conduct. Um, especially if there's a CASA in the scenario, this basically opens the floor to speaking about the integrity, the independence, objectivity, what are the other principles I have written down. Um, integrity, objectivity, professional competence in UK and professional behavior. If there's a CASA in the scenario, speak on that because that also um, allows you an opportunity to generate marks when it comes to pre-engagement. So just at the top of my head, when we can speak about this, let's say for example, there is a client who has a CASA in top management, um, and then there's an integrity issue. And this person is CASA, we can speak about the integrity because it's something that we need to consider as well, that he's not complying to the CPC. And it's a consideration whether we want to accept that client or not. So don't limit your answers to the framework. Speak framework, speak risks in general in the scenario, and speak CPC as well. Lastly, when speaking about CPC, do not forget your safeguards unless they are specifically excluded. So what are your safeguards? Basically, it is what can you do to mitigate that risk? So if I say that there's a self-review threat which will um, compromise the fundamental principle of objectivity, how, what it would be my safeguard for that? It would be to uh, not review that work if I've done that work, get somebody else to review it, for example. Easy, easy, easy marks. Don't forget safeguards. Um, even if, let's say for example, you get into your exam, before you even read, write safeguards on the top of your information page um, so that you don't forget in case it's there. This is something I did a lot, especially with VAT and uh, accounting. I would always forget the tax implications. So for a long while, I would go into my exam, even before reading the information, I'd write tax implications on each and every single page so that I don't forget it um, in case they don't say ignore the tax implications. And then lastly, there's the exam technique, application application when it comes to the section. Especially at a CTA level, you really need to apply the situation to your answers and to the theory. Um, so application is the first exam technique thing I wanted to raise. And then secondly, please stick to your time. I know pre-engagement looks like a whole big pot with so many marks but really stick to your time and move on when time is done because it doesn't help with you staying at the pre-engagement question that's worth 20 marks when you have 80 other marks that you have to fight for in the rest of the paper. So even if you get 50% for pre-engagement, you increase your chances of passing the paper if you move on. So you thinking that you need to sit on this question, on this section and get 80% is unrealistic because then it probably means you're gonna have to, you're gonna probably fail the next question because you spend too long on pre-engagement question. I think I have covered everything. Um, yes, then lastly, I just wanted to speak on the framework. Um, I, I really had the mentality of when you speak on the framework when it comes to engagement planning, you need to go in order. You need to start with integrity, independence, da 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 da. Um, you don't. Uh, you can speak integrity after you speak risks. You can speak integrity right after at the end of CPC. It doesn't have to be in order. They are not finicky when it comes to that, at least based on the past papers I've done. Um, a lot of the past papers don't even have like a structure of the framework that they follow. They literally just write out. A nice thing to do is also follow your scenario. I think it's a smart way, especially because 
when you looking through your scenario and you have like i mentioned that framework in mind it's easy to just skip on important parts with the mentality of oh you know what i'll come back to this i just want to fill up my framework i want to quickly get uh, evidence that uh, this client is doesn't have integrity or that they're not independent that uh, we don't have skills and competence to perform this audit and the engagement letter wasn't signed and then I'll come back up to the scenario and pick up the other risks. So the problem with that is you may run out of time. So actually going with the scenario really helps and it doesn't mean that you're gonna lose marks. Like I said, the framework in terms of what comes next is not important. Um, I think it might be great exam technique to actually go with the scenario. So if they speak on skills and competence first uh, in the scenario, then start with skills and competence and then as soon as whatever they speak on next, write on that and then and then and then and then. Anyway you guys, that is it for pre-engagements and planning. I hope this video really helps you guys. Um, like I mentioned, these are just some tips that I implemented to push my engagement planning mark over 50. This is a great opportunity for you to score marks. Um, but I personally really struggled to move on from this topic because I felt like, oh my gosh, there were so many easy marks over here. So it wasn't easy to be like, okay, time is up. Let's move on to the next topic. Um, if it's any reassurance, um, you can always move on and then if you get enough time come back to that question but really guys it's great exam technique to move on even if it hurts they always told us like you need to learn to let go you need to learn to let go otherwise you reduce your chances of passing I hope this video helped you guys don't forget to like share and subscribe to my channel bye